Well, good afternoon. This is a momentous occasion, especially meaningful to celebrate today at this SCORE conference that Biola University can recognize a historic, a significant, a prophetic voice in gospel-centered racial reconciliation, the Reverend Dr. John M. Perkins. So, it was in 2014 that Biola University established a Charles Colson Award for Conviction and Courage to honor the legacy of the late Christian leader Chuck Colson, founder of Prison Fellowship and founder of the Colson Center for Christian Worldview. Chuck Colson became a follower of Jesus, born again as his first book declared. In 1973, after pleading guilty, in the Watergate scandal, having served in the administration of President Richard Nixon. Chuck Colson, Colson entered an Alabama prison in 1974 as a new Christian, and after being released, he founded Prison Fellowship, which has since become the world's largest outreach to prisoners, to ex-prisoners, and their families, with ministry in over 113 countries. Dr. Colson also founded the Colson Center for Christian Worldview, authored over 30 books, began a daily radio program called Breakpoint, which is still airing today in over 1,200 networks and is heard by 8 million people. In 1993, Dr. Colson was awarded the Templeton Prize for Progress in Religion, the world's largest annual award in the field of religion. He was a personal friend to Paula and me, and he loved Biola University. And I was with him the day he went into the hospital in 2012. And he passed away in that hospital not long after. Dr. Colson's life is an inspiring example of what it meant to impact the world for Christ through a life of conviction and courage, something we at Biola University also strive to do. And it's what I know this room is filled with stories of you who are striving to live with that sense of conviction and courage, because I've often said that conviction without courage goes nowhere. And courage without conviction goes anywhere. But conviction with courage goes somewhere. And that somewhere for us is making an impact on this world for the cause of Christ, and this is what we do. So recipients of Biola's Colson Award are leaders committed to advancing Christ's kingdom through evangelism, through discipleship, Christian worldview education, individuals who defend religious freedom, advocate for the weak and defenseless, men and women who model bold, visionary, and courageous Christian leadership for the next generation. And Chuck Colson lived a life of biblical conviction with the courage to advocate for truth, even when it was difficult, and even when it was unfashionable. His life's calling was to serve and lead others to Christ, to confront injustice and evil, and to challenge Christians to understand biblical faith as an entire worldview that informs all areas of our life. And so much that was good and true about the late Chuck Colson is good and true about our honoree today, Dr. John Perkins, who knew Chuck Colson well and served on the board with him for prison fellowship. So today, as we prepare to hear Dr. John Perkins address us, we also honor him as the sixth recipient of the Colson Award for Conviction and Courage. Following in 2014, Chuck Colson himself receiving this posthumously, Baroness Caroline Cox in 2015, Paul Marshall in 2016, Johnny Erickson Tata in 2017, and Mama Maggie Gobrin in 2018. And with this award, we seek to highlight individuals who demonstrate commitment to the unshakable truths of a biblical worldview and who embody these biblical convictions despite severe risks or challenges. Widely recognized as a leading evangelical Christian voice on matters of reconciliation, leadership, and community development, Dr. John Perkins is a shining light of the American Civil Rights Movement. The author of 17 books and an internationally renowned speaker, Dr. Perkins has advised five American presidents and has been honored for his distinguished service and advocacy with 14 honorary doctorate degrees. 
Dr. John Perkins was born into Mississippi poverty, the son of a sharecropper. He fled to California when he was 17 years old after his older brother was murdered by a town marshal, although he vowed never to return. In 1960, after he accepted Christ, he returned to his boyhood home to share the gospel of Christ with those still living in the area. And his outspoken support and leadership roles in civil rights demonstrated in so many ways in his demonstrations and the marches that he was in resulted in his own repeat harassment, imprisonment, and beatings. In the early 1960s, nearly 60 years ago, Dr. Perkins was invited to speak at the Church of the Open Door, then closely affiliated with Biola University at Biola then at our downtown location. And he was likely the first or at least one of the first African-American leaders to preach at that church. And this began a warm and productive friendship between Dr. Perkins and Dr. McGee, sparking in many ways a new chapter for collaboration and fellowship between black and white evangelicals in America. And today, as you know, if you heard him this morning, Dr. Perkins, 88 years young, is a source of hope and inspiration and encouragement to people of all backgrounds to aspire to that great biblical call towards unity in Christ. And despite dropping out of school in third grade, he has achieved remarkable heights in many areas of his life and leadership. He is a founder and president emeritus of the John and Vera May Perkins Foundation. He has served on the board of directors for well over a dozen organizations, including World Vision, Prison Fellowship, National Association of Evangelicals, and Spring Arbor University. Accompanied by Stan Jantz, past chair of the Board of Trustees, ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Dr. John Perkins. Dr. Perkins, you are an inspiration to all of us, modeling conviction and courage with your prophetic voice, showing us what it means to pick up the cross and follow Jesus every day, even when it's hard. And because of this, it's with great honor on behalf of the Board of Trustees at Bible University that we present you with our 2019 Charles Colson, Colson Award for Conviction and Courage. Congratulations, Dr. Perkins. And now to share the plenary address with Dr. Perkins, I'd like to introduce our own Biola alumnus and trustee, Pastor Brian Loritz. Philadelphia born, Atlanta bred, Biola fed, husband and father of three boys. Pastor Brian has served as a powerful and prophetic voice in, in Memphis, Charlotte, Los Angeles, New York, and now pastors Abundant Life Christian Fellowship in the Silicon Valley. Brian is a trustee here at Biola University, one of our graduates. Brian, you are a dear and beloved friend to me and countless others. Thank you, and we so look forward to the conversation. One more time for Brian Loritz and John Perkins. Well, it is a joy to be here with you, Pop Perkins. I uh, refer to him as that. He's, uh, he's like a grandfather to me, and... Uh, Dr. Perkins was incredibly instrumental in my own father's life. Uh, you knew him when he was a college student, Dr. Perkins. And my dad to this day says it was a conversation that you two had that really shaped the trajectory of his life. So when my last grandparent died in 1998, I adopted, with, it, it didn't matter if he gave me permission, uh, I adopted him uh, as my spiritual grandfather, and you have meant the world to me and a generation of us who have pushed hard in this space. So we honor you today, Dr. Perkins. We're grateful for you. Can I just say a word? Uh, this is a, the end, but uh, hopefully a continuation of what was started in my life. It, really through this movement, the, this revival sort of out of the church of Wadoa and the planting of these uh, Bible churches in the valley. And these are the people who actually uh, helped involved in my discipleship. Uh, Bill Bright's wife, Burnett, and all of those early uh, 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 
people. And, and they're the ones who went with me back to Mississippi and stuck with me. Uh, this has been a joint venture, you know. And so I, I couldn't be more honored than the partnership and the friendship and the longevity of it. You know, I, I, I'm going to quote a, a secular uh, prophet. Henry Ford says, coming together is the beginning. Working together is progress. Staying together is success. That's what God intended the church to be a group of friends. Absolutely. Now, and so these are my, in this room this night, many of these people in here, just a continuation of that friendship that started way back there in the, in the late 50s. I was converted in 54, went back to Mississippi in 60, and this has been my home base ever since. Mm -hmm. So I'm just absolutely, it's honor to be here tonight. And with my friends yeah, <laughs> in here. Absolutely. In this room. So Dr. Perkins, if you've ever spent any amount of time in his presence, one of the things that I just feel from your presence is a profound sense of love and joy. To be around you is to sense that. Now, for those of us working in this space, of really pushing hard racial reconciliation, multi-ethnic ministry, uh, Edward Gilbreth, who wrote a great book called Reconciliation Blues, um, he said, we in the work of reconciliation serve as bridges. And the role of bridges is you get stepped on. That's right. Right? And so you've been stepped on in your life, uh, beaten, People have said critical things about you, called you out your name. Can you talk some about how are you able, I think one of your legacies, we're talking about legacy, is a legacy of love. How are you able to walk in love, even among the ethnically other, who, who has done things that have hurt you? Uh, I think the sort of in illustration would be... Uh, Really, reconciliation is washing each other's wounds. Uh, we can see that with the Apostle Paul. He was on his way to uh, Damascus, really, to kill people like Ananias. But we find him washing away the scales in his eyes and baptizing him. We see... Uh, Paul going to Europe, uh, Macedonia, Philippi, and, and they're in that jail after being tortured by the people he was going to bring to Christ. But we find him that great question, what must I do to be saved? It was uh, the jailer. And that's what that has symbolically been. And it was a little bit in the movie there. And when I was tortured, I didn't want them, but it's difficult to resist love. Mm. Mm. And love is given. We gotta receive it. We gotta receive it. I think it's been that breaking through. I think if they see me as breaking through. I see many of my friends, as they broke through to me, like the doctors and the nurses. But it, was, it, it overshadowed my hate. I wanted to hate them. I wanted to be a victim. Mm. I, I thought that would have been an advantage. Uh, it, it's not my fault anymore. My sins is not my fault anymore. It's their fault. Mm. And I think that hits all of us. Yeah. That hits all of us. And I, I think, too, that in, despite the poverty and all of that, I, I never accepted 
the fact that I was inferior. I don't know how I, and so I think that racism is really uh, both us, all of us uh, believe in a lie, believing that we are not equal and created in the image of God. One believes that they are superior and the other one is frank that they are uh, superior and that's your racism. And then we can love each, we can hate each other back pretty creatively <laughs> and lie. So I, you know, I really, it's, it's, it's really believing in the inherited dignity of the human being mm. Mm. that we was created. I think the American Constitution is the best language that I've ever read on the human dignity. But we, we, we walk it back. We hold these truths to be evident that all human beings are created equal. Then endowed by our creator with certain rights, chief among those, a life, liberty, and we are asking questions about life. That's Christian insanity. <laughs> Black lives matter, white lives matter. God never expected us to ask that question because God is life. He kissed in Adam's Frame the breath of life. Why shouldn't he be a God of justice? If he created us to represent him here on his earth. And, so, and, and the church was left to do that. That's the, so I, I think we got to go back to the Bible. Yes. yes. And, 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 and I think we evangelicals, thought that hearing it correctly, and that ought to be, was as good as obeying it. Mm. The thought in the Bible to hear the word of God is to believe it. And actually, to believe it until the new birth. Yeah. To act upon it. Yeah. And, and that's where reconciliation fit in. If anyone be in Christ, they are new creatures. Yeah. God was in Christ reconciling the world. This is not something that we picked up later and added to it. Neither is justice something. The foundation of God's creation is based on justice. Mm. And love is the way we live out that justice. Right. And live out that righteousness. In fact, justice and righteousness is the same thing. Righteousness is it personalized. Justice is where we want to go yeah. in life. So I, th I think it's understanding it, but feeling it. Right. I mean, feeling it in relationship. Right. And seeing the value of loving each other. It's, you know, right. yeah. So you talk about the need to act upon what the Bible teaches. Right. And you've outlined some of those things. When you were in that cell, having been tortured, do you, do you recall an exact moment where you said, I got to make a decision what to do with these emotions or it's going to turn into a root of bitterness and hatred? Yeah. Was, was, that a, was that a split second decision you made? It, 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 in a way, it was a split second. Uh, I saw the, the hostility and I felt it in myself. If I'd have had an atomic grenade, I would have pulled the plug. Those 19 students, two of them was white, and other black, all of the policemen, I, I would have pulled the plug. But I saw it, and I thought of the gospel. And I said, Lord, if I, I know I was, I know I was, um, uh, bargaining with God. Yeah. I, I know I was bargaining. I think I wanted to get out of jail. Yeah. I, was, I, was, I, was, I said, God, if you would let me out of this jail tonight, I, I want to preach a gospel that is stronger than my ambition. I want to preach a gospel that can reconcile blacks and whites together into one body. I got out of jail. I didn't want to do it. 
there is something comfortable about being a victim. You don't have to have as much responsibility for anything. It's, it's their fault. They done this to me. Well, I live in a world like that. I, I, I can't do it before I try. You know, yeah, so, uh, yeah, it was, it was, it was from God. I, it, and, and, I, and I think, I sort of see pain is, is redemptive. Yes, yes. I think the, the idea of passion is to enter into others' pain. Yes. To hear their cry and that you try to do something about their cry, you know, and you can feel a little of their pain. And so I see that. That's what happened to me. They, 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 they want to wash my wound. I didn't want them to. You know, I, I wanted to be clean, but uh, they could have been my slaves. <laughs> they could have been my... <laughs> but, but, but let's stay right here, though, Dr. Yeah, Perkins, yeah, yeah. because what you just said really is, is what I've experienced. And I'm sure there are many people in this room who are doing the work of reconciliation, but they're the impetus for that has been pain. Some of us may not have dealt with it the way that we should. So when I was in Bible college, first time I was ever called nigger was in Bible college. First time. And that set me in an emotional tailspin, right? So can you talk some about how you practically take the pain that the enemy wants to use for evil and turn it around for good to be agents of reconciliation in this space. Does that make sense, Dr. Perkins? I, I, I think that for the Christian, see, uh, I think we get the reconciliation in the society, a sort of a political, a social reconciliation. We get that mixed up with the, the power of the living word of God. The, see, the word of God is alive. The word of God is living, it's powerful, it's sharper than a two-edged sword. And, and I think it makes more perfect in pain in life. So I, I really think we got to go back to the biblical uh, foundation and really the word of God is activated when we believe it. Mm. Mm. it. It is just talk until we Believe it. Be not just hearers of the word, but doers of the word. Right. And so we got to have this idea that we're trying to bring about some redemption. Right. We got to be the good Samaritan. Yes, sir. Right. And, and all that's the $64,000 question, illustration in the Bible of what it means really to be Christian. Yes. Really, that's loving God with all your heart, all your soul, and all your mind, and then loving your neighbor as yourself. We, we got to be intentional. That's what thrilling me today, this meeting here, this conference here, this idea that we could be here together is, is intentional. Right. And, and, and it's working. Right. It's working because the found had an intentionality right. of doing that. And so the church has got, to, it, it's, it ought not to be a decision you have to make. That's what the church was created to do, right. is to know God and to make him know, know that you are not God. That's important. <laughs> <laughs> so, no, 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 I think, we, I think part of our stuff is reducing God down to us, right. where he become our co-pilot. You know, I use them if I go to sleep. <laughs> I use them. You know, I make a decision uh, on you. Uh, the, the idea is trying to uh, attempt and, uh, to be intentional right. about it. So one of the things now, I know a lot about you. 
And the more I know about you, the more impressed I am. I know some of your friends. I, I talked to Roland Hines the other day. Wow. He's, um, a, he's a pretty great guy. <laughs> I, I, I sort of like him. Because he's a pretty <laughs> tough old cookie. Yeah. <laughs> you, you, you know, he got his conviction. Right. And boy, he, but if... You know I love people. Yeah, yeah, but we ain't gonna put his business out in front yeah, of all these people. Minutes, but, so. but we don't, we don't want him to know what. <laughs> I don't want him to know what. <laughs> right. So, but here's what I'm saying: to, to know you, right? You have real, authentic friendships with the very ethnicity who harmed you. How has God used those relationships with the Bill Brights of the world? Um, the role in Heinz, and we can just call the role, to, to continue to do a work in you, those cross-cultural, multi-ethnic relationships. I, I, I think that we got to reach the place that we can speak the truth and love, get angry but sin not. I, I, I think that we, I think we got to, uh, and we got to, I, and I think it's, a, it's, it's, it's the need for each other. Yeah. I tell my friend all the time, Howard is here. I tell him all the time, oh. I said, man, I, it's, it's neat to know that I know you and I know that you love me. It, that sustains you. Yes. It, that sustains you yep. to know that you have a friend. You, you know, and to know that they, and God gives them the gifts and skills and talent, and we can be involved in each other's life. Right. I mean, it, I, I think that there's a confidence. Yes. I have studied as much as I can revolutionary leaders, and most revolutionary leaders come from a sort of a class where they feel a little bit activated. They come in out of society from the middle class and up, and the middle class mind. Think of Martin Luther King. Mm. Uh, think, think of Mandela. Think of Bakov. Think of uh, Don that was a lawyer. It's it's something about that sense of 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 equality that frees you. Faster to any other people's pain. Right. So, yeah, yeah. We'll go home on this one. So okay. there's a great book that I read called Stamped from the Beginning, Ibrahim uh, Kendi. It, it's, a, it's a breathtaking book where he analyzes the history of race in America. His argument is substantially things have not gotten better. And to my knowledge, he's not a believer. As you look through the 88 years of living, what would you say about race relations in America? We've made legislative gains, but what would you say, uh, do you feel like we're getting better as it relates to relational issues of justice, and what is your hope for the future? I, I, I think the first step where we fail in which our uh, black-white ethnicity in, in, in life. We have failed to affirm the inherited dignity of each other. We got to start the train. And our racial reconciliation, it's hard for God to take a lie and make it the truth. We try to do that all the time. I have tried to do that. It, it don't work out business-wise. <laughs> you, you know, you can't go out and do that. In, in, in life. And so the truth, the truth is that humankind was created in God's image. I think we need to go there. I think we need to go there. And, and then I think our benevolence will come out of that. It won't be tokenism. It'll be application. And, and, and that's another thing that middle class know how to do, is know how to apply their resources to their goals in life. Right. You know, so I, 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 what we're doing is racial reconciliation 
it's too little. I think we can still profile people. I think we can, we can pro profile them, the Hutus and the Tusas and the Jew and the Arab. You, you won't get there. I think when we come, I mean, this, is, this nation had promise a renewal. We laid out a platform. But just with a few incidents that we took, one nation under God with liberty and justice for all. And just playing around with that and just little amendments to it. I think, I think the church should believe that. And if we could, the church could believe that, I think we could make it work. At least we would be that call out group. We would be looked like that in group uh, from all ethnic, not race. You know, the Bible don't talk much about race. Race is something we created. And now we have demonized race. And, 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 and to me, the insanity in race, black lives matter. Life is of God. He that love, love is the expression, the best expression of life. Life is for God. He that know God is born of God and know God. And that's the mission of the church is to know God and to make him known, to know God and to make him known. I put that in four principles, four biblical principles, uh, I put it as the commission that Christ says the Christian life is the outliving of the inliving Christ. The other one is Acts 1 8, you shall be witnesses unto me, make him known in the world. And then, of course, you, he's so big that you know you're not God. He's not God. And, so, and, and that's important. That's important. You, you can't be after, you can reflect God through our humanity. But boy, God is what else to die. He's big. And that's where we've got to approach it. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, Dr. Perkins, we are following in your footsteps. You have blessed us. Uh, if it wasn't for you, I wouldn't be doing what I'm doing. God has used you greatly, and you have lived a rich legacy. If your life has been blessed through Dr. Perkins, would you give God a hand clap of praise? Discover who you're called to be at Biola University, a leading Christ-centered university in Los Angeles, with programs on campus and online. Subscribe for more of our videos and learn more at biola.edu.